morning. Uh, so, Diana Pikus, and she's going to talk about global ISO. Okay, thank you. So, some of you may have already heard about Global ISO. Uh, it's the new instruction selection framework that's being developed in LLVM. Uh, and it's been spearheaded by Apple for the 64-bit RMVA target, also known as ARCH64. Uh, recently, other people have started contributing. For instance, there's Christoph from ARM, there's myself from Lenaro, uh, some people from Intel and AMD are also sending in patches. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about status at the end of the talk. So right now, let's see what Global ISO is and how it works. So first of all, so we're all on the same page. Uh, instruction selection is a phase in the compilation process where the code is translated from the target independent intermediate representation used by the middle end into the machine specific representation used by the back end. Uh, so in our case, this is the LVMIR, which we all know and love, hopefully. And uh, machine instruction or machine IR or MIR, which uh, may be a bit new to some of you if you've never worked in the back end. So we're going to talk a bit about it. Um, so this is a simple example with a function that just takes two values and returns their sum. And like I said, this is very close to the machine. So for instance, you have this uh, add wrr. So this is an add between two registers. That's the rr. There's also a version for immediate. That's ri and so on. And the w means that it works on the w registers, which are the 32-bit registers in v 8 uh, so that's pretty close to the machine, but it's far from being an, just an in-memory representation of assembly. So it's still abstract in many ways. Uh, for instance, it's in, in the SSA form, so it can contain fee instructions. It does contain fee instructions uh, up until register allocation. Uh, it also has virtual registers. So if you'll notice here, we have these percent %w0, percent %w1. These are physical registers. But you will also notice these percent zero, one, two, and so on, which are the virtual registers. And these are in an infinite number, and they're the ones that the backend mostly works with. So the physical registers are usually used for very specific things, like for if you know from the ABI that stuff is gonna it's gonna have to be in that register. Otherwise, you're gonna want to use a virtual register. So that's why we insert these copies from the physical registers into the virtual registers that we know how to work with. And these registers, uh, unlike the ones in LLVMIR, they don't have a type, but they have a register class, which in this case is GPR32, so a 32-bit general purpose register. Um, another thing that exists in the machine IR is pseudo instructions, which are instructions that don't correspond directly to a hardware instruction. They're used for various purposes in the back end. For instance, if you want to uh, have a certain sequence of instructions that really have to stay in that order and you don't want the scheduler to put anything between them, like, uh, I don't know, accesses to the thread local storage descriptor or something, you're going to use a pseudo instruction for that and then expand it later on in the back end when you know it's safe to do so. Uh, so that's about enough about the machine IR. Uh, at the moment in LLVM, instruction selection uses yet another intermediate representation known as the selection DAG. It's a graph of nodes. We're not going to talk about it. All you need to know is that it's pretty complex, and it's different from both LVMIR and the machine IR. And the instruction selection on it goes like in a number of steps. First of all, we build this new representation. Uh, then we run a series of combines, which means we uh, replace certain sequences of nodes with uh, different sequence. And we do this to make it easier for the subsequent steps to deal with the code. Um, then we run type legalization, which means we get rid of any types that aren't natively supported on the target. So for instance, if you have a 64-bit type, but your target only has 32-bit registers, you're going to want to break it up into two 32-bit values and so on. Uh, then we run more combines. Then we legalize vectors. Then we legalize types again, because maybe legalizing vectors introduced more illegal types. Then we run combines again. Then we finally legalize. Uh, the operations. So for instance, if there's a division operation, but you don't have hardware division, you might want to replace it with the library call, stuff like that. Uh, then again, <laughs> more combines. Uh, then we finally select the instructions, which means, so now we know 
everything in the code can actually be handled by the target. But now we have to actually replace uh, this with actual instructions. Uh, and we do this with some complicated you know, pattern matching algorithm that is not the purpose of this talk. Uh, then at the end, we schedule the instructions, which at this point is really just a way to linearize this graph. It's not the scheduling in the back end. We have other passes further along that deal with proper scheduling. And then at, way at the end, we finally emit the MIR. OK, so as you can imagine, this has quite a number of drawbacks. First of all, it's difficult to learn because it's you know a whole new representation, a whole lot of steps. There are a lot of subtleties for each target, like what each series of combines can do or not. Um, there are all sorts of issues with that. It's very difficult to maintain, test, and debug because you can't run just one of those steps at a time. You have to run the whole instruction selection pipeline. And the most you can get is some uh, debug dumps after each step, which is good, but it's not great. So we want to do better there. It's not very flexible because every target has to go through the exact same steps, and it only has a limited set of hooks to customize the behavior. Uh, and because of this, we have all sorts of pressure on those combines to try to fit the code into something that the rest of the framework understands and can do a good job with. And we also have uh, fix up passes that run after instruction selection on some targets to patch up things that can't be selected properly with this framework. Uh, another problem is that it has a lot of inherent overhead because you have to build a whole new representation, you have to run all those steps. There's actually so much overhead that we have yet another instruction selection framework, which is not global ISL, it's fast ISL, which was introduced several years ago. And it only runs at O0. And it's basically a trade-off. So you're going to spend a lot less time compiling, but you're going to generate really naive code. And it doesn't use any intermediate representation. It basically just generates the first thing that comes to its mind. And when it doesn't know how to handle something, it falls back to selection DAG. But other than that, they don't share any code. Or you know, they share very, very little code. Um, so for these reasons and others, people have started working on global ISL, which is meant to address all these issues. We want it to be easier to de develop, easier to test, easier to maintain. Uh, we want to have the same path for both fast instruction selection and high quality instruction selection. Um, we want more flexibility for the targets. And since you're probably wondering about the name, uh, the previous instruction selection frameworks worked at a basic block level. So during instruction selection, you could only see the current basic block. Uh, with global ISL, you have access to the whole function, so you can see where the operands come from, where you're using the result, even if it's in a different basic block. So we're hoping to be able to make use of that in the future. Um, so the way we're going to achieve all these wonderful goals is by not creating yet another intermediate representation. And instead, we're just going to use the machine IR, but with a few new concepts like register banks and generic instructions that I'm going to talk about soon. Um, but the core point here is that uh, the meat of the representation is the same, which allows us to structure the whole instruction selection process as a series of machine passes, uh, which is great because we have a lot of infrastructure in place for dealing with passes. Like We can run a single pass at a time, which makes it easy to test. We can uh, dump the IR before and after a machine pass. We can uh, get debug dumps for a single pass at a time if we want to. Uh, it's also very flexible because each target can now introduce any number of custom passes at any point in the instruction selection pipeline. It can also replace one of the standard passes with something custom if it needs a different approach to do things. Uh, and hopefully it will be faster. <laughs> we can't know that yet. Um, so now that we're convinced that machine passes are awesome, let's see the standard pipeline. Um, so if you recall from the previous uh, selection DAG stages, we're kind of doing some of the same things. For instance, the IR translator basically just builds our representation, so we're, um, we're basically getting our custom machine IR. 
at this point. We're going to talk about each of, of these in detail later on. Then we run legalization, as we did before, but this time it's just one step. Uh, we're going to have register bank selection, which is a new concept. It's, uh, it was introduced specifically for global ISL. We're going to see why. And finally, we do instruction selection, which, as before, means selecting target-specific operation code. So let's take them in order. The IR translator is going to take as input LLVM IR, and it's going to output generic machine IR, which means that instead of those uh, target-specific opcodes like add WRR, we're going to use uh, generic opcodes like generic add, generic branch, generic store, and so on. So to get a feel of this, uh, this is the same code as on the previous slide. This is the final uh, machine IR that we're trying to obtain. And on the left side, you can see the generic, the corresponding generic machine IR. This is as far as the IR translator gets us. And what you should notice here is that, as I said, we have the generic ad here. And at this point, we don't care that it's adding registers. We don't care if it's legal to add things on this target. We just know that the intention of the code is to add two values. And these values don't have register classes yet. As you can see, there's a dash here. But instead, they have some types. And these are different from the types in the LLVM IR. They're closer to the machine. And basically, they're um, scalar values on any number of bits, uh, pointer values into any address space, and vectors with uh, any number of elements of any dimension. Um, some of you may notice that at this point we already have uh, the physical registers here and some of the final operation codes. And this is because of one very important thing that the IR translator does, which is ABI lowering. So at this point, we already know that the target says that you know, the parameters are going to be in W0, W1, so we're just going to put them there right from the start. Um, you should note here that although it's possible to have uh, final machine IR at this point, it's not compulsory. So the target can choose to use uh, generic opcodes for ABI lowering as long as it preserves the intention well enough. Uh, right, so now we have our presentation. We're going to legalize it. And as I hinted earlier, the legalization in global ISL is a lot simpler than the one in selection deck because of one key decision, which is uh, that it's not types that are legal or illegal. It's the combination of operation and type that is legal or not. Uh, and it's interesting, we actually had discussions about this. Some, some of you may have seen on the mailing list uh, with x86 with the AVX instruction set where suddenly we have uh, legal I1 uh, vectors. Uh, but if we legalize them only for the AVX instructions, then we're kind of breaking things in other places <laughs> where we don't want them to be legal. So now we're not going to have that problem anymore because we can say, okay, it's legal only for this operation, not for anything. So hopefully this is going to solve a lot of similar problems. Um, and at this point, the target you know, is going to have to say for each combination of operation and type, uh, what it wants to do. It can mark it as legal, in which case the legalizer does nothing. Or it can choose one of the predefined actions, like, like I said, widening or narrowing a scalar, which means you know, breaking it up into smaller types or introducing extensions to larger types. Uh, for vectors, you, know, you can uh, ignore some of the lanes or you can break it up again into smaller vectors and so on. Uh, you can replace with library calls, or you can have uh, your own target-specific custom C++ code that does whatever it wants with that operation, whatever floats its boat. Uh, of course, you can also mark it as unsupported, in which case instruction uh, selection will just fail. Uh, so that's it about the legalizer. The next phase is the register bank selection, which, as I said before, is uh, new to global ISL. And the concept of register banks is also mm. new to global ISL. And it roughly corresponds to the hardware concept of register banks or register files. So for instance, on uh, ARMv8, we have two register banks. There's the general purpose register bank, and there's another one for floating point and vector values. So these can have 
you know, different dimensions, different numbers of registers, um, naturally copying data between them may be more expensive than within the same bank. Um, and certain instructions have uh, different variants depending on where their operands live in which register bank. So for instance, you can load a value into a GPR or you can load it into an FPR and they're entirely different operations. Or you can uh, do a bitwise uh, or on a GPR or on FPRs. Uh, and it's very important to get it right from the start. This is another pain point with selection DAG where uh, many times we selected the wrong instruction because we didn't know where the operands would live and then we things could be a lot slower <laughs> and uh, or in some cases they, they could even be incorrect because at that point you have to introduce copies between register banks and there are targets where it's legal to copy in one direction but not in the other and instruction selection had no idea about that so now it's going to be a first-class citizen of instruction selection and hopefully we can handle all those problems up front. Um, so assuming we have select, oh, and another thing here is that we can decide to spend as much effort on this as we want. I mean, if, if we're running Go Zero and we don't care that much about the quality, you know, whatever, sure, we're, we're going to introduce a lot of copies as long as they're legal, sure, why not? And at this point, we actually have uh, two algorithms for this. We have fast and greedy. We can add any number of other algorithms in the future. It's easy now because we can just replace things. <laughs> um, right, and finally, there's um, instruction selection. So at this point, we know that everything is legal. It corresponds to something that the hardware can actually handle. Uh, we know where it lives and roughly in which register bank. We don't know the exact register yet, but we don't care. Um, so at this point, instruction selection, you know, just replaces with the machine-specific opcodes. So on the same example, we'll just have to replace the add with the add WRR because here we have two registers that live in the GPRs, which is really nice. And we, again, we have to uh, constrain uh, the virtual registers so that instead, they, instead of having a type and the register bank, they have a register class that the rest of the backend can understand. So you're probably wondering at this point, what's the difference between a register bank and a register class? Why do we have two? Uh, and the reason is that the register class is much more specific than a register bank. So for instance, a register class can be, OK, general purpose registers, including the stack pointer, or want to handle it or can't handle it. Uh, or for instance, on thumb, some instructions can only access uh, eight of the general purpose registers. So we're going to have a register class for that. So we know they're in the general purpose register bank, but we want to be more specific than that. And this will be important, obviously, for the register allocator and other passes. Um, so after we've done all of this, we're ready to you know, pass it on to the back end to do its magic. Like I said, this is where we're going to do register allocation, scheduling, target-specific optimizations, whatever. <laughs> um, OK, so now let's talk a bit about the current status of all this. Um, like I said, there's, this has been in work for over a year, but it's still, we're still considering it a prototype. It is built by default, but it's not enabled. By default, you have to pass a certain flag, like dash global ISL, or if you're working from Clang, you have to tell it to pass it to the backend. So you use dash MLLVM dash global ISL. Um, we also have um, another nice flag, which is global ISL abort equals zero, which means if instruction selection fails, don't abort, and instead fall back to the previous instruction selection framework. So this is to make things more robust, to allow us to test things. Uh, we're probably going to be using this for a while, um, even after we enable by default. Uh, so there's a lot of work in progress in Global ISL at the moment um, on several fronts. One of them is improving the framework itself. Uh, so one of the directions here is to generate more code automatically. Some of you are probably familiar with TableGen. 
If you're not, it's a tool that we're using in LLVM to generate code from some very simple descriptions of registers or instructions or whatever. Uh, and these are used all over the backend. And this is an actual example of what the definitions for the register banks look like for ART64. So for instance, you have the GPR register bank. It has a name, and it has a register class. The register class is associated with it. And this is one register class. But the nice thing is that uh, register classes have subclasses. So if you're covering one register class, you're covering all of its subclasses. So what we've actually said with this line is that we're covering about 11 or 12 register classes. And it looks really simple, and behind we're going to generate a lot of code to say, which tells us, you know, uh, if a register in this class can live on this bank or the other way around. So we can generate a lot of stuff from this small snippet of information. And for the FPR, again, this is a lot of classes here. It's like 60 or something. Um, Another front where we're working hard is target adoption. So since this was developed initially for ARCH64, that's naturally the one where it's progressed the most. So it now passes over 60% of the test suite without falling back to selection DAG. Um, there are actually plans to replace FastICell for O0 uh, this year. And you know, at the moment, it's naturally a lot faster than selection deck because it's not doing as much. And for instance, all those combines, we're not doing that. We're not selecting anything too complicated. At the moment, the instruction selection in global ISL is not very intelligent. It's Like I said, we're trying to replace fi fast ISL, which is just generate the simplest thing possible. Um, so the hope is that in the end, it will get within 1.1x within of fast ISL. And there's we're going on here, especially at Apple, and we're trying not to stop, step on their toes too much. <laughs> we're letting them do their work. <laughs> um, most other people are working on the other ports. So like I said, I'm working on the ARM port, which is uh, the non-64-bit ARM V8. So that means it's 32-bit ARM V8. It's all the older ARM, uh, thumb, and so on. Uh, AMD are also contributing patches for their GPUs and X86, Intel for x86. Um, nobody's in any rush with this because, as I said, we're working a lot on improving the framework itself. So for instance, uh, for ARM, I'm working a lot on ABI lowering because that's target specific and it's very likely to stay that way. So that code is, I can write it and it's probably going to stay that way. <laughs> On the other hand, if I write things in the instruction selector, that's very likely to go away. It's going to probably be replaced with something generated automatically by TableGen. So I don't want to invest a lot of time in supporting oh, a lot of instructions and stuff. I'd rather uh, support all, as m many calling conventions as I can instead, because that's a better way of spending time at this point. So um, to summarize, uh, this is happening. Uh, as developers, we're very excited about it. I think uh, most of the people working in the back end are going to be uh, happy with many of the design choices in Global ISL. Um, if you're just an LLVM user, unfortunately, you're probably not going to see the effects of this anytime soon. I mean, even if it gets enabled by default this year for O0, that's just going to be an ART64. It's probably not going to be great from the start. <laughs> so there's still a lot of work before this can reach the users. But uh, as any change that makes the developers happy, eventually the users will feel the results. Um, so for reference, we have docs, which explain how, how to port to a new target and everything. Uh, there's also a very in-depth presentation uh, you know, about the APIs and everything. Um, and this was given by Apple at US LLVM. You can watch it if you have a target that you want to port this to. Um, and that's about it. Any questions? Go ahead. Uh, are you going to reuse the current uh, table gen file? All right. So the question was if we're going to reuse the current table gen. And the answer is yes. Uh, so Apple is working hard on this. This is actually the first point here. 
the, <laughs> we're trying to use those to generate code that fits global ISIL. So we're trying to keep the same descriptions, but you know, do things in the global ISIL framework instead. Good. What's the current plan for combines? Because that's a lot of code. Oh, that's a lot of code. And the plan is, uh, it's not part of this prototype, but you know, in the future, we're hoping to reuse them. So that's also going to be part of this whole table, Jen effort. Yes? Can it go back with the start to the slide with, um, with the transformation, IR transformation? Uh, IR translation? Yeah. Just this. Uh, Here? Wait, one more. Here? Before, before, before. Before, before, before. Uh, yeah, the, over there. Um, question is about the one down there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, you mentioned that you, you translate this to a scalar a pointer of the actual values. Um, is there an idea to support, to distinguish uh, native pointers versus pointers to managed uh, objects for languages which are just the aware? Oh, uh, <laughs> I honestly don't know. So if the address space is not enough, then it's probably not supported right now. So th the only thing you can specify for a pointer is the address space and the number of bits that it occupies. Oh. So. If you can model it with that, then it works. That's if you can, now. yeah. Okay. Please. Uh, can you estimate the effort for the architecture for the work needs to be done? Um. At the moment, I would say there's a lot of work because we're not generating enough stuff automatically, but hopefully. Uh, you know, if we can replace the instruction selector with one generated automatically and the legalizer with something generated automatically, then there shouldn't be much effort. All you have to do is, port, is uh, the ABI lowering, as I said, which is basically just one class that you have to inherit and you have to tell it how to uh, lower returns, arguments, and calls. So that's not an awful lot of stuff. And you have to write the descriptions for the register banks, which again, shouldn't be too much effort. And then, of course, there's a lot of work with tuning it, getting it to do things. Yes. So uh, what is uh, the current uh, status for AR64? Are we able to request the compiler, or um, do we have uh, uh, things to add? Uh, there's still stuff to be added. So it's 63% of the test suite. Those were the last numbers <coughs> that were published. So. And it doesn't include self no, it doesn't include self-hosting. Okay. Yeah. Here, go ahead. Uh, right, so the question is if it's built by default, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> so this has happened quite recently, I think, in the past couple of weeks. Yeah. So now we're building it by default. All the bots are building it. It's and testing. And testing, yeah. Anything else? Nobody else? No. OK. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>